Hi, let's experiment Python interpreter in this video. In our earlier video, we discussed about the theoretical understanding of the Python interpreter. In this video, we are going to exclusively discuss on the practical approach of the Python interpreter. Now, if you look at this environment, it's a Jupyter notebook where I'm going to punch in some Python code. And this Python code is going to get executed in the interpreter environment. As I said, Python does not perform a pre-compilation process. Means, once you generate a source code, you will not compile your Python code. Rather, you directly trigger the interpreter and hand over this code to the Python interpreter environment. And there it does the job of lexing process, parser, and compilation, generates the bytecode, and then hand it over to the interpreter the virtual environment and then finally the virtual environment will generate the zeros and ones of it and then executes your source code finally so here i'm going to define a function you might not understand what the function is all about in python right now because uh, we are ahead of the topic but let's understand a small source code of python and see how the source code is getting executed <coughs> I'm defining a function called foo, which takes in some parameter like x, and uh, we give some local variable declarations like y equals 10, and then we are going to perform some operation called multiplication, where x multiplied with y, and that value is going to be written from this function. It's a pretty simple self-explanatory code, not too complicated, but this is a source code of Python. Right now, the code what you're looking at is actually the source code of Python. It's a complete Python source code template. Now, are we running in a Python environment? Yes, of course. A Python environment is triggered behind the scene of this Jupyter notebook. This is a GUI mode of editor, graphical user interface, we say it as. So here, the Python interpreter is running behind the scene. So how do we execute this code? Do we need to compile this code? using some compilers or so? No. That's what we saw in the architecture of the Python interpreter in our earlier video. So here we are not going to see any such compilation process. Rather, we are going to execute the code directly. So for execution on Jupyter Notebook, we are going to use a shortcut key called Control Enter. And by this way, you can see one execution have happened. And right now, the source code got executed. But we are not getting to see any results because we are not calling the function we are not printing the output of that function so let's do that now in the next line so let's go ahead and call the foo function by forwarding the value called 10 for my variable called x and get the results stored in another variable now you can call a function called print in order to print the value of that returned result so you can print the value of that variable called result. So by this way, if I again say control enter, the second time the interpreter is going to be invoked in order to do the process of lexing, passing, compilation, and then interpreting. All these uh, components will get into the picture. So let's execute now, you get the result. So I forwarded the value called 10 to the parameter variable called x, and that x is multiplied with y, y's value is 10. So 10 into 10, we get the result of 100. Pretty cool. So as simple as that in Python. So here I'm not embracing with any class or I didn't create any object. So there's no need for creating a class when you want to run a simple script of a Python. You can straightforwardly go ahead and define a function, call the function, pass the parameter, and then uh, get the result of the function and then, and then print it. That's all you have to do. But what exactly happens? How do I trace the object code? We were discussing about object code in the, uh, in the specific uh, uh, architecture of the uh, Python interpreter, right? So what that object code is all about? We'll see step by step. I'm going to a new cell in order to track the object code. So the function is all about foo. If I just try to print that foo, you get the uh, the, the template of the foo. So foo is a function which takes some parameter. It just says what type the foo is. Foo is a function type. Okay. Now on top of that foo, I wanted to know 
the object code. So I'm going to use a double underscore with the name called code and then I'm going to end with double underscore. So by this way, you call a code variable on top of this function and that double underscore variable is actually called as a dunder. Dunder meaning is double underscore. Prefixing and suffixing with double underscore. So it's a dunder variable. Whenever you come across with a variable prefixing and suffixing with double underscore, you presume that it is a dunder variable. It's a magical variable. We'll discuss more detail about it in our further sessions. If I execute this, you see some object code, right? This is what I was trying to brief you in, in my earlier video. The code object is generated for this particular function. Now, I wanted to see the bytecode of it. Okay, this is all about the code object. Later, what happens? The bytecode is getting generated from the compiler, right? So I wanted to see the bytecode. So I can say co underscore code. So when I say co underscore code, which is another child variable of my code variable, you can see the actual bytecode representation of my function. So function source code is getting converted to a code object and then the code object is further converted to a bytecode. So right now what you're seeing here is nothing but the bytecode. Great. So we knew how to track the code object and how to track the bytecode. But the actual bytecode will not be seen this way. I wanted to see the exact bytecode file. Is there any chance? Because we don't compile the source code, right? We don't compile the Python file. If we are not compiling the Python file, how do we get to know the presence of that PYC file which we were discussing in our earlier session? I was briefing that inside the interpreter that you have a compiler and the compiler will generate a bytecode which is in the extension of a .pyc. So how do I get to know about the presence of PYC? So what I'm going to do for that right now is I'm going to go out of this Jupyter Notebooks uh, folder, a directory, where in this directory I already have a pre-created Python file, py file. You can notice that similar function is there. I've already pre-written this, okay? And the file name is called as abc. And the extension of the file is py file, abc.py. So this file is there. But right now, if you see, there is no generation of pyc file happens for this abc. So I'm going to generate the pyc file explicitly with some uh, library of Python. To earlier to uh, understand these codes, no worries. We will learn about all these intrinsic uh, codes more in detail in the later session. But right now, my intention is to show you how that PYC file gets generated. That happens internally into the interpreter. So it is hard for the developer to go into the interpreter and see what's happening. So that's why there are predefined libraries are there, which will, which will help us to understand how a PYC file would look like. So now let's go ahead and import a library called py underscore compile. By this way, we import one external library and we will be using that py underscore compile module and call a function called compile function. And in that function, I'm going to generate, I'm sorry, I'm going to forward the file called abc.py. I'm into this directory, the notebook, Jupyter notebook file is this. And this file and the abc file are located in the same directory. So in that case, you can directly access this abc file like this, abc.py. Now, if you notice, there is no other folders are there. Okay, you only have a, a Jupyter Notebook directory, a checkpoint directory, but that's nothing to do with this abc. We don't have any other directory in this particular uh, directory structure. So once we provide that abc.py to the compile function of the py compile module, and if I execute it, you can see that there is a generation of cpython-38.pyc file got created for this abc.py. And it's located in a special directory called underscore underscore pycache underscore underscore. So let's go back to the directory. See there, there's a new folder got created or a directory got created. And in this, if you drill down, you will see there is an 
abc.c python-38 abc refers your source code file name and this is going to be considered as your uh, class file or the compiled file of your python source now when i open this when i open this you can see that you have some junk characters present inside that particular file this is how a bytecode would look like obviously because these are intermediate language code where a normal human being can't understand such kind of a code but if you notice closely you can observe some function name like foo you have the function name here okay uh, you have uh, some module which you have imported okay so all these are there here in this and uh, it might not be readable for the uh, for the human but then it's readable by the interpreter this interpreter will convert this bytecode further to a machine code with the help of the virtual machine we talked about in the earlier video it will convert it to zeros and ones and start executing it so ideally we will not do this process of compilation i did it specifically here to explain you how that pyc file gets generated and how a pyc file would look like so you can you can use this couple of code in order to generate a pyc file out of a python source code and the extension of that file name is pyc as i said earlier and if you open that pyc file you will see a chunk uh, set of characters which is ideally uh, unreadable for the human human and uh, and the interpreter can interpret that and then produce it a machine code and then finally gives you the output so the output that you see for that function is 100 and that happens because the interpreter have converted the bytecode into a mission code so this is your source code hand over the source code to your uh, interpreter and the interpreter will perform its multiple component stages so lexing parsing compilation producing a bytecode once you get the bytecode hand it over to the interpreter the virtual machine and that virtual machine will finally manipulate the bytecode and then generate a mission code of zeros and ones which is the final execution stage of the machine and produces an output for the human.